Welcome to this video on evidence-based practice in midwifery care. This short lecture is intended to give you a background on evidence-based care and how it is applied in practice. There are points where you will be asked to pause the video and reflect, so watch out for these. Okay, let's begin. The objectives of this session is that you are able to define evidence-based practice, abbreviated here as EBP. You should be able to discuss the rationale for evidence-based practice and discuss the use of evidence-based practice on both an individual and a group level. Before we begin the rest of the session, I want you to think back to when you were last in practice. This could have been done, this could have been when you were a student midwife or in your nursing career or if you'd worked in healthcare before you came to midwifery. Can you think of a time when you observed something that was done or said because that's just what we always do around here? Pause the video and resume when you are ready. You might have been able to come up with an example of this fairly quickly. Unfortunately, sometimes there can be a culture in some aspects of healthcare or some healthcare settings where things are done because, well, this is just what we've always done. Rather than following clinical guidelines or policies that are based off evidence, individuals may instead follow norms. Norms are shared standards of behaviour by groups. They can be informal or formal, and they govern the behaviour of the members of those groups. Now, whilst a norm could be based on evidence, often they're not and this can lead to poor practice. Examples of norms in maternity may be not allowing women with epidurals to eat a light diet during labour, which is not strictly evidence-based, but may become part of the culture and therefore the rules, that informal norm of a practice in a maternity unit. However, this isn't an acceptable way to practice, as we should be providing care using the principles of evidence-based practice. So what is evidence-based practice? Evidence-based practice, or EBP, refers to the integration of clinical expertise and judgment, patient preferences and values, with the best available evidence from systematic research to guide decision-making in specific clinical circumstances. Essentially, it means using current high-quality research findings to inform one's clinical practice. And the core idea behind evidence-based practice is to ensure that the decisions made in healthcare are supported by sound evidence, which leads to better outcomes, more efficient care and increased satisfaction from people who use healthcare services. This approach is in contrast to decisions that are based solely on tradition, intuition or anecdotal evidence, which we know are not you know, good don't provide good rationale to make healthcare decisions. So by systematically reviewing and applying research findings, practitioners, such as midwives, can offer treatments and interventions that have been proven effective, reducing the likelihood of harm and improving overall care quality. And it's important to note that evidence-based practice can be applied both at an individual and a group level and each has its distinct applications and implications. At an individual level, this is related to clinical decision-making. For clinicians, this often means integrating the best available evidence with their own clinical expertise and the unique values and preferences of each client. A good example of this is a consultant midwife who may run a birth choices clinic. She would review the latest research um, on the as relevant aspect of childbirth for the, the specific women's circumstances, and then she would discuss the options with the woman, considering her own unique circumstances, um, potential risks and benefits. As individuals, um, evidence-based practice can empower um, people to become more informed about their own health. Um, if they can understand the evidence, patients can actively participate in decisions about their care and have a more meaningful discussion with healthcare providers. 
Now, a lot of the evidence-based practice you will see um, as a midwife, as a midwifery student, will be um, on a group level. And that is because a lot of our practice is governed by guidelines and policies. So on this larger scale, evidence-based practice informs the development of clinical guidelines and protocols. And that is from organisations such as the World Health Organisation to NICE, down to you know, that individual trust level. These bodies can review vast amounts of research, more than an individual midwife would have, ever have time to do, and they can provide guidance on best practices for treating certain conditions. In terms of population health, your public health officials might use evidence-based practice to make decisions about interventions that will benefit larger populations. A good example of this um, is looking at the evidence that show that certain vaccination campaigns reduce the prevalence of disease in the community. For example, the recommendation that pregnant women receive a whooping cough vaccine. Quality improvement, something that all hospitals will implement, um, and they may use evidence-based principles to enhance care quality across a local population. That could be implementing new technologies, it could be looking at care pathways, it could be looking at how we um, structure systems. And finally, at a system or organisational level, evidence can guide how resources are distributed. For example, if the evidence suggests that a particular intervention is highly effective and cost efficient, a healthcare system might prioritise its funding. But in both individual and group settings, evidence-based practice is about ensuring that decisions are informed by the best available evidence. Whilst the individual level focuses more on tailored care, the group level emphasises broader strategies, policies and interventions. So what is the point in evidence-based practice? It's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And people might say they're practicing in an evidence-based manner, but why is it fundamental, I think, to midwifery? And that's because respecting women's voices, their bodies and their agency in the delivery of care is a fundamental component of midwifery practice. And evidence-based practice is a direct way that we involve women and service users in their care. But what also, what about, you know, evidence-based practice for midwifery? So as midwives, we do try to challenge a rigid paternalistic approach to childbirth to promote holistic, compassionate and safe childbirth. It's often said that maternity care is a benchmark for human rights in a society. And evidence-based practice can assist us to deliver care that is both safe and personalised. If we look at that definition of a midwife from the International Confederation of Midwives, the midwife is recognised as a responsible and accountable professional who works in partnership with women to give the necessary support, care and advice during pregnancy, labour and the postpartum period. I think this quote highlights that midwives must work with women to involve them in their care rather than making decisions for them promoting informed consent and taking into account women's preferences. And evidence-based practice can really help us do this. I'd like you to pause the video and reflect again. Look back on your experiences working with women. And can you think of a time when you have observed a woman's choices or values be ignored or disregarded? Unfortunately, it's highly likely that you'll be able to remember a time when this occurred. Thinking about my own clinical experience, this could have been a time when a woman's birth preferences were minimised in a high risk obstetric setting. And can you think and can you see the link between the poor care that this person received and the lack of evidence based practice? Because if it had been a truly evidence based approach, that person's choices, values would have been taken into account. So we're going to focus a little more on each component of evidence-based practice now. Um, we're going to start with client, patient, service user values, and I will use those terms interchangeably as you might have already noticed. 
So client values. So this includes risk perception. So risk perception is a complex process. It's highly influenced by individual beliefs, experiences, cultural norms and emotional reactions. It is a personal evaluation of the dangers associated with a certain activity or decision. And this, of course, is going to be different for everybody. What I might find risky, you may think is a walk in the park. And we can take skydiving as an analogy. So, for instance, tandem skydiving has an accident rate of roughly one in 500,000 jumps. If you imagine two individuals, Maya and Samira, contemplating the idea of skydiving. So Samira grew up in an adventurous family. From a young age, they were introduced to various adrenaline pumping activities from rock climbing to whitewater rafting. When Samira thinks of skydiving, she focuses on the thrill, the view, the sensation of freedom and the accomplishment once she's landed. To Samira, the inherent risks of skydiving are outweighed by its potential rewards. Maya, on the other hand, grew up in a much more cautious environment. They hear lots of stories about accidents and mishaps that are related to extreme supports. When Maya thinks of skydiving, she thinks of the horrible height, the moment the door will open, what in case the parachute fails, what if she's carried off by the wind. For Maya, the idea of jumping out a plane feels like an unnecessary gamble with life. But both Maya and Samira are presented with the same statistics about skydiving, that one in 500,000 I just told you. So it's relatively safe. There are safety regulations and a low incident of accidents if you conduct it properly. But their personal histories, past experiences, emotional reactions and individual thresholds shape their risk perception differently. And it's the same with choices that women will make around childbirth. Some women may feel that the risk of a hemorrhage post a cesarean section is too great for them. Equally, some women may feel that um, the chance or the risk of a third degree tear during a vaginal birth, you know, that is an unacceptable risk for them. It's also important to note that women have a legal right to know all of the risks and benefits of diagnosis or treatment and make their own judgment. This is as a result of the 2015 Supreme Court Montgomery ruling. The Supreme Court determined that healthcare professionals have a duty to ensure that a patient is aware of any risks in a proposed treatment um, and of any reasonable alternatives. What is considered a risk is what a reasonable person in the patient's position would likely find significant or what the doctor knows that the specific patient should, you know, would likely find significant. So this Montgomery ruling underscored the importance of personalised care and patient autonomy. It really emphasised that medical professionals such as doctors and midwives need to engage in a two-way dialogue, ensuring that women are active participants in decisions about their health and care. And this patient-centred approach to informed consent is a really significant shift in medical law. So to be practising in this evidence-based manner, you need to take in those clients' values. Moving round the wheel now, we'll talk about the best scientific evidence. So research evidence that we may look at could be systematic reviews, meta-analyses or Cochrane reviews, which are to some extent, you know, type of systematic and meta-analysis. Um, the highest levels of research evidence is sought when making healthcare decisions for several reasons. So firstly, we want to minimise harm. Safety is paramount in healthcare and has been a focus of recent inquiries into midwifery practice, such as Ockenden and the Kirkup reports. Utilising the highest level of evidence minimises the likelihood of harm or adverse effects because higher quality studies are typically designed to control for biases, confounding variables, and other factors that may impact the results. Decisions that are informed by the best evidence are also more likely to um, lead to effective outcomes, because again, they're using, they're looking at robust evidence. And we can also think about cost efficiency. Inefficient treatments can be costly, um, both in terms of how much it actually costs, um, but also the opportunity costs, which is the potential benefits 
that we have lost by not going down the original effective treatment straight away. Um, it's also important for patient trust, so knowing that decisions are based on the best available evidence can instill trust in the people who are accessing our services. Um, and from a legal standpoint, practitioners who base their decisions on recognised high quality evidence are in a better position in cases of malpractice or negligence. So, in summary, the highest level of research evidence offers the most reliable information. And where the stakes are high, such as in maternity care, decisions need to be informed by the best possible information to ensure patient safety, effective outcomes and the optimal use of resources. And our final point on the wheel is clinical experience. So clinical experience serves several roles in evidence-based practice. It can consist of contextualising research evidence. Whilst research evidence provides good generalizable findings, clinical experience helps healthcare providers apply this evidence to specific scenarios. It aids um, in understanding which findings are most relevant and how they can be adapted to unique circumstances of individual patients. And if you think about when you're caring for a woman in childbirth, it may be that she's very tired. It could be that you need to pay close attention to the clinical scenario and setting to really apply evidence to its best effect and provide the right kind of information to the woman you're caring for. It's also important that we fill, um, we, well, we may need to fill evidence gaps. So not every clinical question has been or ever will be thoroughly researched. Um, sometimes evidence will be scant, outdated, inconclusive, and therefore clinical experience does become essential. If we think about maternity, there will be many questions in maternity that we can't answer because it wouldn't be ethical to do research on that group of women. Um, women may also present with a combination of symptoms, conditions that aren't precisely replicated in clinical trials. And experienced clinicians can recognise patterns and understand variability. Um, clinical experience also gives providers you know, a good idea of how to communicate with women. So if we use the example of someone in labour, someone who is in pain, someone who's very tired, we're going to need to explain things um, with a different approach. It also allows clinicians to break down complex medical concepts that are in relatable terms and it also may be helpful to use anecdotes so that to provide a kind of deeper understanding. And clinical experience, the longer that you are clinically qualified, you know, your experience refines um, how you do your clinical assessments, how you uh, which tests you order, etc., um, that can again, you know, enhance the information that you need to, you know, help facilitate evidence-based practice. Okay. Um, so the process of evidence-based practice. So evidence-based practice can be seen as a series of steps, but it is a process that is multifaceted, um, and it does require this structured approach. So as an outline of the process, it begins with asking the right question. So ideally you want to identify a specific clinical problem that needs to be addressed. You then do have to search for evidence. Ideally this is done on databases. And most hospitals will um, have a library which hopefully allows access. Um, and you can look at all the clinical evidence repositories, databases, look for those meta-analyses, the systematic reviews. Um, that evidence then does need to be evaluated. There is a lot of research out there that is not very useful, that is very poor quality. And we need to critically evaluate the quality, relevance and applicability of that evidence. And that includes looking at things like study design, sample size, looking for bias. Then have to think about how we can apply the evidence to the case or to your question. You want to integrate that evidence with clinical expertise, 
specific circumstances and preferences of an individual if you're doing you know, an individual care plan. And you also have to consider the practicality, the resourcing you need, any barriers that might occur. And of course, we always want to um, evaluate the implementation of any practice. We need to look at the, how the outcomes have changed. Ideally, they would have improved. And you want to use a feedback loop and make sure you're closing that loop to understand if the change was acceptable for um, the client group you were investigating um, or for the healthcare staff who were implementing it. And this is a step is really crucial because even strong evidence from research may need adjustments when you apply it to real world settings. And this should really be a wheel because what is really important that healthcare institutions adopt a culture of continuous learning where we continually seek the evidence, we continually update it um, and that can be done through you know, formal guidelines development or you know, done through professionals, uh, professional development. So obviously implementing evidence-based practice in healthcare essential is in healthcare settings is essential and the ideal, but there are of course barriers to evidence-based practice. These barriers can be broadly categorized into individual, organizational, and systemic factors. So individual factors include a lack of knowledge and skills. People may not be aware of, of evidence-based practice, um, but also people may lack research skills. So they may not be able to find research. And then if they do find it, they might not be able to um, interpret it and they may not be able to appraise it. Individuals also might have attitudes and beliefs that make them resistant to change. They might be quite skeptic about the value of research and People may think, well, research isn't very relevant to individual practice. And finally, people may not be very motivated. Working in healthcare is often stressful. Um, people may lack confidence to do things in a new way, or they may fear um, making mistakes and having criticism from their peers. In terms of organisational factors, a culture an organisational culture needs to prioritise evidence-based practice and a lack of leadership support or role models that practice evidence-based practice will result in a lack of um, EBP. If there are insufficient um, time allocated for learning, insufficient resources or lack of access to any resources um, is also another organisational factor that will limit evidence-based practice and that goes hand in hand with a lack of ongoing training, training or professional development opportunities for staff. If there is an absence of um, individuals or systems to facilitate um, the development of EBP such as um, clinical decision support tools, protocols and guidelines, this could also be an issue. And finally, um, systemic factors. So not all research is accessible. Um, articles might be behind paywalls or the hospital might not subscribe to them. And those research findings may not be directly applicable to your, your patient population. Um, there could be regulatory or policy constraints. So existing policies might be in conflict with new evidence-based interventions. And finally, financially, you know, implementing evidence-based practice could require a big financial investment and, you know, funding limitation can really hinder, hinder this. So whilst the challenges are numerous and um, the potential benefits of evidence-based practice in improving outcomes, reducing harm, ensuring efficient use of resources, make it a crucial endeavour for healthcare systems worldwide. So, more positively, um, there are of course things that facilitate evidence-based practice, and we're going to focus on three.
So the first is a culture which requires this leadership commitment. This should be visible support. Leaders should endorse and you know, participate in evidence-based practice initiatives. Resources, whether that's funding or people, um, so there is time available for evidence-based practice. A culture of commitment and collaboration is also required. That's interdisciplinary collaboration, so between the healthcare professions. Um, and also open communication, where questions, discussions, critical appraisals of practice are really encouraged. Um, commitment could be through dedicated evidence-based practice roles, dedicated units, for example, a guidelines midwives, a policies midwives. Um, and time. We all know that having enough time, particularly if you're working clinically in the NHS, is difficult. And time and having enough mental slack, so the ability to think creatively and spend time addressing a problem rather than being stressed or preoccupied from working in a clinical environment is essential. So we've talked a lot about the benefits of evidence-based practice. However, there are also criticisms. So one is that it can be susceptible to publication bias. Publication bias um, is where positive results are more likely to be published than negative ones. And this is because generally you want to publish research that is interesting and exciting and will change the world. But that means we don't often find out what didn't work and actually knowing what didn't work is as important as knowing what did work. Financial conflicts of interest can also influence which studies are available. Um, and how their results are presented. So always think about who is funding this research. Could they be introducing bias? Um, and there is also a criticism of evidence-based practice that there is a reliance on quantitative data. So it prioritizes um, looking at research that is from randomized controlled trials, for example, over other types of evidence. And that can also sideline valuable quantitative sorry, qualitative research, which is on patient experiences um, that can provide a fuller understanding of care. Um, it's very resource intensive. We spoke about how you know, it requires time, it requires a financial commitment. Um, in a stretch healthcare service, we have to think about how we spend our money. Um, and potentially when used to develop guidelines, evidence-based practice could restrict choice. It may be that then the unit where this, this guideline is implemented, everybody then has to follow the guideline. And that means that suddenly we've got a one size fits all approach that can really limit the flexibility and adaptability that is required for individualized care. People can then get a little bit tied up in saying, well, we need to follow the guidelines or you're, you're out of the guidelines you're not following the guidelines when actually we probably need to think on a bit of a more individualized level and not let a guideline overshadow individuals women or patients preferences and values so in summary evidence-based practice can be implemented at a group or an individual level and both have got you know clear uses and are both very useful but we do need to make sure that we don't overshadow individuals preferences by overlaying group policy onto their care the values of your client your woman your service user are key these are what we need to listen to if you take away anything from this lecture, I'd like you to take away that we need to listen to women and the choices they make about their care. And if we're not listening, we need to start listening. And finally, evidence-based practice is not perfect. Um, I don't think you know any approach to this can be perfect, um, but it's something that we still need to strive for and we still need to be improving the outcomes of people who use healthcare services in the UK and evidence-based practice provides a useful way to do that. So thank you for listening. That takes us to the end of this um, short lecture. Um, I hope you've been able to take some things away from it that will then go on and support you um, 
as you apply your learning. If you are interested in further reading, um, I would recommend um, Clue and uh, Bluff Principles and Practice of Research in Midwifery. And also um, Pollitt and Beck, Essentials of Nursing Research, Appraising Evidence for Nursing Practice, which is a very good um, book all about research in nursing, applicable, of course, to midwifery. And finally, uh, this article by Kerl and Lothian, Evidence-Based Evidence Maternity Care, Can New Dogs Learn Old Tricks?